We're going to actually have a wonderful panel here. We're so fortunate to have um, the founder and community manager of uh, three tech companies from uh, Boulder here in the room with us. And I'm hoping what we'll talk about a little bit about is, um, on the one hand, kind of their own experiences growing up as makers and as engineers and as people who are intensely passionate about this stuff, but then also about what kids really need to learn in the classrooms today from both their professional experience of hiring lots of folks and then, and then um, just seeing what kids are made of. And they, the, the companies are wonderful. And we have um, Ross Ingham from Spiro. The lights are changing. <laughs> I didn't know this was going to happen. This is tech. It feels very formal now, doesn't it? <laughs> like I want the lights. Um, Ross Ingram from Sphero, I'll have come up, and he's a community manager there. Um, and he started his first tech company, actually, when he was 19 years old. <laughs> um, and has been running them ever since. So um, it, it, he sold it just nine months later. I mean, this is like the dream, right, of every kid in our classrooms to, to, to create things and sell them. Um, and really, his job now is about uh, providing challenging environments and helping children uh, learn. And I can't wait to hear his perspective on play and the products you'll see that he's making that really, that his company's making that really uh, help children learn through play. Um, it's funny, my, my daughter actually did a, a six page exhibition paper this year at Macintosh Academy for her sixth grade. Uh, they have a big challenge at the end of the year. And she wrote about these three companies. Um, she wrote about Spiro, and SparkFun um, and uh, Mod Robot, who are the wonderful people we have about to come up to you. And it's the start of the project was actually my kid's a nature kid, and she is like technology. Forget about it. Like I don't want to do anything. If my classmates chose this project. It's about technology. Like I hate technology. And I asked her like why that was, and she said, Well, I get bored. And I asked her, Well. God, these seem pretty fun. Like, what's, what's boring about this to you? And she goes, well, it's so frustrating. I can't get it to work, and then I don't know how to do it. And I was like, aha. <laughs> like, that's why your teachers love this stuff. That's why we built robots in the second half. And she fell a little more in love with the technology. Um, but actually, we found out by the end that she probably should have been writing about what the tech, the block in exploring the world that technology sometimes provides, because she's my nature girl, you know? <laughs> and, but seeing that process for her of choosing her own, um, finding these amazing technological toys that we're gonna get these guys to talk about how they teach kids, um, and then really unco uncovering some of the blocks to the harder things we do in school, that when kids say they're bored, sometimes there's something else going on, right? It's frustrating, so all the more um, important to help them learn to work with that. So I'll have, um, since there's, this is already set up, I, can we pull it forward into the light or get more light? Um, I'll have you guys come up and we'll introduce you each. All right, well who we have in front of you, um, I've already told you a little bit about Ross. Um, we have Eric Schweikert, did I say it, say it right? <laughs> Pretty close <laughs> at this end of the table. And um, he is a designer of tools, robots, architecture, and software. Um, he's been developing mod robot cubelets and moss to really teach children about complexity and systems. And how you do that with a toy is part of what we're going to hear about. Um, a wonderful company in Boulder. Um, and then we have Nathan Seidel, who I was first introduced to actually through a TED Talk. So you can go online and hear more. Um, actually, both of you guys have TED Talks that are really worth listening to about complexity. And then um, it, it really a f kind of a founder and pioneer in the open source movement and looking at technology that way. Um, Nathan will tell you a little bit about himself, but uh, he, as an engineer, he thought he'd go out and patent stuff. And now he's making the, the things that help other makers make. <laughs> so it's that well-described. So it's SparkFun. And SparkFun, 
um, has a wonderful booth and is a sponsor of the Maker Faire as well. So go and play and solder circuits. I don't know what all you'll be doing out there, but there's terrific stuff to do. So I'm gonna, each of them are going to take about five, seven minutes to just tell you a little bit about them and their passion and their sense of purpose um, and, and what they've made and why. Um, and then we'll have some time for questions from you all. So this is a little bit of a longer segment where we get to, to play and talk. I'm going to turn myself off and hand you guys the mic. Is that handheld OK? You got it up there? While we're working on, yeah, house lights. Um, so I'll just start us out so we start. Um, I'm Nathan Seidel from SparkFun Electronics. And Gia was so nice to introduce me on the, the TEDx talk was about intellectual property obesity. So uh, at SparkFun, I started it 12 years ago. Uh, company been around for a while. It's privately held. I started it while I was at CU. We currently have about 145 employees. And what we do is we design electronic devices to teach electronics. So what that means is I had to learn all this stuff myself senior year of college. And now I've got my niece and my nephew, fifth and fourth grade, learning scratch and building little things to interact with the world. And I would much rather talk about my projects than my business. Um, so what really excites me is um, volunteering at the Kids Museum out in Lafayette. Um, trying to build exhibits to withstand small children 12 hours a day. That is engineering. That is the challenge. Uh, and so I volunteer there building various things where you hold on to it and it reads your heart rate or um, you wave your hand around and it turns on lights and plays music. All of the parts built with SparkFun stuff. And then at the same time at SparkFun, if you come out to the building, um, we've got a beehive that's got a load cell underneath the beehive so we can look at the, the weight change over time. Right? All the bees leave in the morning, and it drops in weight. And then throughout the day, they come back, and then they enter the beehive again. So you can look at that weight change over time. Now, how do we do that? We have um, some technology, but you don't need a, an electrical engineering degree to hook all this stuff up. It's just a tutorial. It's just, hey, let's combine this with this sensor with some Arduino code and hook it to the internet and check that out. So I'd much rather tell, tell you about my projects. Um, but if you're interested, uh, sparkfun.com has a lot of educational resources. Who wants to go next? Eric. Sure. That was rapid fire. That was good. Any chance for house lights, lights, illumination? This, oh, oh, thank you. Yay. Well, and, um, I actually also blew it. You guys gave me slides. You worked hard to have two pictures. So um, it, can we bring that slide? Are you guys good? All right. Well, we'll make sure that we have them for after. <laughs> so, okay. She has been blowing up my inbox for the last <laughs> week trying to get the slides. And then here we are in our slides. Uh, Thanks for the lights. Y'all are very beautiful people. It's nice to see you. Uh, I'm Eric. I'm the founder of Modular Robotics. We're in Boulder, and we make robot construction kits. Uh, I didn't bring any, but you'll see some on the slides later. We make two different types of robot construction kits. Oh, wow. That it, yeah, that's good. Uh, so we make two kits. We make one called Cubelets, which is for kids four and up. And it's a set of robotic building blocks. Each one does something different. You snap them together. There are sensors. There are thinking blocks. There are actuators. And kids, four-year-old, five-year-old, six-year-old, are building robots before they learn how to program, before they learn about wiring or electronics, building simple little reactive robots that drive around on the table and stop before they fall off the edge. We sell Cubelets primarily into schools. Then we make a second product called Moss. It's another robot construction kit. It's a little higher ceiling. It's for slightly older kids, maybe eight, nine, 10 and up. And it lets you build more kinematic, creepy, crawly, walky constructions with little steel spheres acting as hinges uh, and lets you build robots that creepy, crawly, walk, interact with your iPhone. Also no programming, no wiring. So we sell Moss primarily as a toy, Cubelets primarily into schools. And when we're working with schools, we work with individual teachers, and we work with schools, and then we work with districts, including a couple of them who have upwards of 5,000 cubelets, which is really crazy. And we teach a lot of STEM. And if you go online to modrobotics.com, you'll see tons and tons of free activities and curricula and lesson plans, learning STEM, a lot of basic subjects, and then branching out into additional things like biological systems, modeling spread of disease, space exploration exercises, all of that stuff. And I'm happy about that, I'm proud of that, and I'm really excited, but since you guys are the in-group, I'll let you know that it's a Trojan horse. 
I don't really care about STEM at all. I feel like there's so many great products and so many great teachers and so many great curriculums and books and everything, STEM, 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 that I'm not so worried about our kids learning STEM. I mean, I think they must and it's important, but it's not really the passion that, that kind of drives me to do what I do. I'm really interested in complexity and emergent behavior. So if you've ever looked around in the world and been a little depressed by the stupidity of humanity or by our inability to solve big problems, you're not alone. Right? Like, we're kind of dumb as a species. We have a hard time with the hard problems, like the hunger and the social inequality and the war and stuff like that. And all of those things have in common the notion that there are emergent behaviors made of systems with millions and millions of individual little agents all interacting, and then they result in something like a society that's doing something wrong or like a degraded natural environment. And we lack the tools to solve that. We can't operate in those systems. We, we like, promote ham-fisted solutions. We're gonna do the mileage law or something like that. That's gonna help. We're gonna send more troops somewhere. That's gonna help, right? And it doesn't really help because we lack the ability to think about complex systems made of lots and lots of little agents interacting together. We default to oversimplified explanations like good and bad and black and white and red and blue and these like sound bites that don't represent systems in the world at all. So. Uh, that's what we're trying to get to kids with, with both Cubelets and Moss, is giving them models of complex systems, giving them models of systems made out of lots of independent agents that all work together, and they can start to gain intuitions about how behaviors emerge, about how patterns emerge, about how changing one little element in a complex system can have ripple effects and change the behavior of the whole system. And eventually, hopefully, if we get to enough kids and let them, you know, give them the tools to build their own intuitions about how the complex world around us actually works, we'll end up with a bunch of kids that are way smarter than we are. <laughs> so. So Eric and I have been friends for about a decade, and I always go first because he's always good at going. So I'm glad I went first with that one. Yeah, I'm, I'm not that impressive, so I'll just go last. <laughs> um, so hi, everyone. I'm Ross. I'm with Sphero. Um, I lead our community team, which is all about the people and the products that we build for our people. Um, so I guess a show of hands real quick. Who here has heard of Sphero at all? The Oh, cool. <laughs> it's working. <laughs> um, Cool, yeah, so for those who haven't, we make app-enabled robot toys. Uh, we have two toys out there currently. One is uh, this little round robot ball called Sphero. Um, we have another one called Ollie. It goes about 14 miles per hour. It's really fast and almost diabolical. Um, and then we also have another product coming out later this year that is kind of related to the Star Wars universe and uh, you know building uh, droid-like like robots. So we're super excited about that. But at, at Sphero, you know, we believe that play can be such a powerful teacher. Um, when we originally started out with the, uh, the, the company, we didn't really have any plans to make Sphero an educational tool. Um, but as we, as we grew up and matured and our products matured, we saw this need that Sphero could, could help um, kind of enable creative expression through technology. And, uh, you know, fast forward today, Sphero is found in over 1,500 classrooms around the world being used not only to teach kids coding, but really how can they use technology in creative ways to express themselves. Um, and so that, that's kind of what we're all about. And uh, it's, all, it's all about play and, and, and having fun. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> I actually want to give these guys over to you all if you have questions, um, or we can, we can kind of start with some essential things. I mean, what was it like for you all growing up in school? And I mean, you all have these minds that go, right? <laughs> and, and these spirits that want to make. And I'm curious for you being in school, both your experience and then what you might have wished for from your teachers. Or if, or if you had fabulous experiences. I mean, sometimes we learn from bright spots, too those things that really did inspire you? Maybe you can talk to us a little bit about that. I had a very strong uh, math and science high school. So I started college with a fair number of AP credits in calculus and physics and all the basic stuff. Uh, all that did was it allowed me to take some extracurricular classes freshman year of college. The, the biggest one was machine shop, right? I was a nerd. 
I don't know how to use a hammer. I don't know how to turn a screwdriver. I don't know how to change metal into something else. And that was one of the best classes I ever took, not for credit. And the only way I could have gotten that was through the advanced courses that I took in high school. So had I, could I do it all over again? Um, I would have used my hands a whole lot more the entire time. Um, so the very first Maker Faire I went to, I don't know what it was, eight years ago, the first one in San Mateo, um, I went there and I was kind of looking around. I was like, oh my goodness, there's people like me. Here's my tribe. I had no idea people like me existed. So it was a really formative thing. And now I'm looking at it and I'm like, oh my goodness, what happens when we enable all these seventh and eighth graders to have that same experience? And it's happening and it's shocking and it's wonderful. Um, so that's kind of what gets me up in the morning. Um, yeah, it's really exciting. Mm. Um, so the question is about like school and growing up. I was a horrible kid. Like. Um, <laughs> I, uh, for, for a lot of my, my life, I grew up in like a single parent household and didn't really have uh, much in terms of access to technology, but was always curious about it. So I was fascinated by it. And uh, I, I, was, I was actually talking to my mom two weekends ago and uh, she had found my high school transcript and I had a solid 1.1 GPA. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> solid D student. Um, and I was actually, uh, my junior year of high school, I was expelled because uh, I, I wanted a computer, but we didn't have one at home, so I decided to go to the computer lab at my high school and just steal one, <laughs> which probably wasn't a good idea. <laughs> um, I ended up getting arrested and charged with like two felonies at 16 years old, and uh, you know, it was, at the time, it was a horrible experience, but I think what I learned from that was, um, you know, at that time when all these people were giving up on me, there was a small group of teachers who saw this, um, this curiosity for technology, and they used it as a motivator to turn me around, to get me back um, on, a, on a path that, uh, you know, it essentially changed my trajectory. And I think all of us here in this room have that opportunity to spark some other student success, to be able to use whatever they're passionate and interested about and help change their trajectory. Mm. Thank you for that. It's an awesome story. Thanks for sharing. Uh, I didn't learn anything in school. <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of kidding. I'm sort of being provocative, but uh, let me explain. Uh, I don't think I really learned a lot in school. I learned a lot to describe stuff in school. So I played with Legos as a kid, pretty much solid from birth until 12. Love building with Lego. That was my jam. That's what I liked doing. And Lego, playing with Lego, building a lot of spaceships, didn't teach me math. It didn't teach me physics. It didn't teach me science at all. There were no equations. But it, develop, it helped me develop intuitions. Right? Intuitions about shape and intuitions about balance and friction and structure and form. I mean, even shape and color, kind of all of those things. So that when I got to school later on and I got to physics in 11th grade, I remember sitting there thinking, well, of course, we all know what's going to happen. We're all familiar with this stuff. These are just equations describing the phenomena that we're acquainted with really normally, and then I'd look around and I'd see people that maybe didn't have that hands-on building experience with intuitions, with minds just exploding with all the lambdas and Greek characters. Um, so school was interesting for me, but I'm big on the power of intuitions. You know, there, there was an interesting question and answer on assessment and assessment on desk-bound things and assessment versus trebuchet. And, you know, I, I, I strongly feel that even if we did that assessment over and over and over again and found rigorously that kids didn't learn as much playing with the trebuchet and that they learned more for all assessment purposes that we wouldn't be able to quite measure those intuitions. Mm -hmm. So I remember a lot of my school is just being descriptions of things that I was already familiar with and formalizations of things, but not necessarily giving first exposure. Mm -hmm. And I feel sorry for kids that who have first exposure to concepts like you know, with cubelets, we're trying to we're trying to teach computational thinking, right? And I feel sorry for kids who have to learn about loops and recursion and feedback and control and networking and all of those things out of a textbook in a C programming class for the first time. Like those are concepts that you can explore with your hands and learn much more easily early on. Um, yeah, it's yeah. cool. 
Very cool. <laughs> well, I'm curious about that too, because you guys are all kind of techy and technical, got into computers, and and I had one um, actually fabulous person we're going to hear speak who's from the Aurora Hyper Lab, Ron and Charles Dukes, um, who were really asking the question of like, what about like, I mean, y'all have excelled in some really complicated technical fields, and you're probably brilliant. It's probably why you didn't fit in very well, like early on. But what about the other 85%? Like, what about the kids that we don't know that they're gifted and talented in these kinds of areas? Like, I know this is kind of a funny question, but what do you think about for those kids? And I'm blindsiding you with one that I didn't prepare you with. But I'm curious about, like, everyday kids who are sitting in classrooms. Like, what do you bring into them? And, and how do you see, I mean, think about some of the kids even around you. Like, wh how, how does what you're doing help? And what would you bring into that? Um, I, I think for us at, at our company, uh, like I said, being able to use technology, it really doesn't matter the form factor, but being able to use it in a way that allows a kid to creatively express themselves, I think is, is one of our major goals. Um, me personally, I'm not really interested in I guess the, the rich kids or the, uh, the kids who have access and opportunity. I'm mostly interested in how can we get access to some of these kids who you know, may not have a vision in their mind of what they could be through technology. Um, and then also having fun, right? Uh, this is, uh, I mean, what, what if school was a place where kids went to invent things instead of learn things? You know, what, what if it was, instead of, uh, you know, this rigorous day-to-day, -day, like, ah, oh, crap, I don't want to go to school. They're, like, excited to go to school because they can go express themselves, whether it's through technology or, or creative writing or art. That, that's a future education system that I think is exciting for me. Um, I, I think a little bit more long-winded. Uh, I won't talk too much more, but I think right now we're experiencing a time in society where people are like, oh crap, we have to teach kids how to code. And I, f I, I think like 500 years ago, the same conversation probably happened like, ah shit, we have to teach kids how to read. Like, <laughs> we gotta teach kids how to write. So I think teaching kids how to, how to code and, and, and involving technology is just another step in society's um, growing up process. And uh, I don't know, I think we can all agree that technology is just another path to, to all that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So we, we have a, a huge community on, on Twitter, and teachers send us pictures of kids using Ciro in the classroom every single day. And we're blown away by the ways that they're using it. We've provided some tools and some lessons in curriculum, but they've taken it and extended it beyond our wildest dream. For, for example, at a second grade class, they sent us um, pictures of the kids using uh, using Sphero for creative writing. So they're they're creating a narrative around uh, a Sphero. Like last week, we also went out to this place in Kentucky, and they the kids were basically dipping the Spheros in paint and driving them around and creating art. And uh, so I think there's physics, there's math, there's coding, but. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can express yourself creatively, whether it's through Sphero or, or SparkFun or Moss or Cubelets, you know, it doesn't really matter the form factor. As long as technology is being used, you know, it, it shouldn't just be an hour-long session in the classroom. It should be integrated into every, everything that kids are doing throughout the day. So it, you can see more on, on our website and stuff, but. I want to hear other questions. Yes, that's fair. Great. Other questions? On the issue of complexity, and one of the things I love about the maker movement is the, the breaking down of silos, that, that concept of using technology plus paint, you know, the concept of, of having a weaver put together with somebody who does light art. Uh, I don't know why we became so siloed as a society. And, and I think that the, one of the challenges in solving complex problems in our society at, at any age, whether it's kids or adults, is is being able to collaborate to discuss things, and, and we're losing a lot of that with the way the media is. I was very surprised to, hear, to listen to a TED talk of a woman who, um, 
I'm sorry, I've forgotten her name, Jane, who was talking about how gaming teaches collaborative solution. And, and I'm one of those parents, my kids are in their 20s now, I'm one of those parents that, you know, used to keep kicking them outside. You shouldn't be gaming, you should be outside. Now I'm like, God, you should be in gaming and collaborative solution fighting. <laughs> so I'm wondering, since that, you know, that, that complexity issue is one of is one of the things we look at. How can we use some of these technologies to help uh, people of all ages, of all all learners, uh, to to work together to find solutions to things? I have a great I have a great answer for you, and a tee into something from Ross next. Uh, that's Jane McGonigal, probably, and she's yes, totally yes. awesome. Reality is broken. She gave a great TED talk. When we were first starting our factory, uh, so we make all of our stuff in Boulder. We make all of our robot construction kits in a big factory in Boulder, Colorado, with 50 hourly assembly workers who we fondly call elves. And uh, consumer electronics and toys are not made in Boulder, Colorado. They're made in China, all of them, uh, except for a couple of strange cases. When I first saw SparkFun a few years ago, they make everything in Boulder, and I thought, oh, well, this is how it's done. We'll just make our factory in Boulder. Uh, that's, that's not actually how it's done. That's what we're doing. So as we were starting our factory, I read Reality is Broken and thought about assembly work in our factory. So when you get a job at Modular Robotics, you start at $8 an hour. And you know, honestly, the work is kind of mind numbing. It's factory work. We're putting circuit boards into little plastic robots and we're boxing them up and we're sending out the door and it's assembly line work. So after reading that book, we started our elf tier system and our elf gamification system. And now when you start working at Modular Robotics, you're in elf tier one and you start working for $8 an hour and you accumulate points. You accumulate points for every task that you do on the assembly line. You accumulate bonus points for doing those tasks fast. You accumulate 10x bonus points for breaking the speed record on some of those tasks. You accumulate bonus points for perfect attendance in a week. There are all these reasons to accumulate points. Points are never lost, they're only accumulated. And when you reach a certain level of points, you level up to elf tier two and you make nine bucks an hour and at elf tier three you make 1150 an hour and you get a two modular robotics t-shirts and a pint glass and then at elf tier four you become a supervisor there's this like elaborate wonderful game and that's worked out really really well for us all of our best people are high up on the elf tier ladder they're actually making a living wage which eight dollars an hour is definitely not uh, and we've seen it be just this great motivator for, for moving up at the same time we're, we're looking at uh, gamification ideas for onboarding people onto our system. So Kubelets and Moss more so is a little high threshold. Moss is a little hard to figure out. So we're looking at ways to gamify the experience and incentivize kids to keep pushing through and, and go to expert level. And we look a lot to Spiro for that because they've been extremely successful, I think, in gamifying the onboarding experience and then figuring out how to encourage kids using game mechanics to keep playing and to keep learning. So maybe you want to <laughs> I love the way you guys help each other out. <laughs> That's how you know each other well. Other questions? As folks who are creating literally dozens of great jobs in Colorado, I'm curious, you know, what can we be doing in our classrooms to make sure that we're preparing students to succeed in an environment where maybe desks aren't in rows and where hard work comes? <laughs> so one of the, the tenets at SparkFit is um, yeah, that piece of paper you have is lovely, but show me what you've made, right? I, I don't care what it, whether you're, you've got an undergrad degree, a master's degree, a PhD, it, what have you done with your life? And the people that work in engineering may not have a double E degree. The people that work in Marcom might have a physics background. The people in tech support might have a PhD. It's, it's all across the board. It's just kind of wherever your passion lies. So I think to answer your question is really to show folks it's it's not just about getting that grade or that score, it's about you know taking that and applying it to your passion. And when you're really passionate about something, you, you share that. And I, I think that's kind of what my peers share is a passion for what we do, and that's really what drives us. Um, so that's what I would recommend. That's, that's the type of people I want to employ are people that are passionate and have done something with that passion. The person that just asked that question actually is Noah, right? <laughs> um, who does uh, badging for, uh, and you can actually go and see uh, Help Me Hack It Tomorrow, the assessment one as well, that, that talks about other ways of assessing. And think about like high tech meets um, the Girl Scout badges of past and actually being able to see what people have made 
to build their skills and not just get that piece of paper. So it's, it's kind of cool that we do have, you run a, a conversation every Monday night on Twitter about um, how we can innovate in that place and actually Ron and Charles at Aurora School District are starting to implement um, at the high school level this badging system to help uh, kind of make real those skills. Um, yeah, it's that passion, that tangible passion. So, Other questions? So the badging thing's a really good question since yeah. you were talking about how gamification changed your warehouse environment, mm -hmm. right? How do you know when you've got a bullshit badge? Which, <laughs> by, that I mean, by that I mean you've changed A to awesome badge zero, right? You've not actually changed the underlying structure. You've renamed the thing that you don't like so much, and you're dancing the celebratory we've made a difference dance, but you haven't actually changed anything. So how do you know that you improve conditions in that work environment when you built a gaming module around it, as opposed to just gave it a new name? Turnover. Uh, for us, just reducing turnover, uh, retaining more elves for a longer period of time. So our badges, we actually, they're actually called badgers. We have the elf tier system, and then there's a whole tertiary layer of bonus badgers, and we have little embroidered like Boy Scout merit badge things, which is really, really fun. Uh, and the badges don't really need to mean much. All they are, are 25 cents more hour on your pay, 50 cents an hour more on your pay, all of these other little things. And all we're trying to do with that is make modular robotics a great place to work. So we know that without it, it's just a factory. And we know that with it, people talk about loving it, people talk about moving up the ranks and having a way to improve. And I guess when I think about it, personally, I love the objectivity, like the Dungeons and Dragons style game <laughs> environment that it gives you know, an entry level career. So people aren't coming to us and the loud people are getting the pay increases and the quiet people are not getting the pay increases. It's, it's an across the board thing. But, you know, we have some dumb badges. You get, a, you get a badge if you sweep X number of times, but it doesn't really mean much. You get one penny added on to your pay. So that, that hasn't been a super big concern. <laughs> was, I, I feel like I wasn't quite. It's in the ballpark of the question, right? Like it's still, uh, you seem like you want to respond and you're smarter than I am, so I'm gonna let you. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Um, I was just going to say, uh, we, we, I don't have badges, but I have a tier system just like Eric does. And what we found is that it's, it's good for the people, but it's also good for us. Because it forces us to think about our training and our crossing the, crossing the T's and dotting the I's. And so I'm wondering from a you know, business perspective, that's really important to us to make sure that every employee understands that you need to know these things and so that you can progress through your career. How can you apply that to badges in the classroom? I don't know, maybe we, you know, it, 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 it badges force you to think about what we need to teach that person for them to be successful. So that's that's how we use it in the business world. I, I assume it works the same in the classroom? No, I don't think it does at all. My concern is that typically what we've done is we've gotten excited about the new name for the thing that still sucks mm -hmm. and it's a terrible experience for children. Well, but you, you've helped me by, by articulating that what you're doing there is trying to understand both what it is you want to have happen which I think in school doesn't happen, and make a bad, make a little bit of joy and mirth and excitement in a not so great thing. Hey, bud. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Talk about failure. Talk mm -hmm. about what happens when you fail within your respective cultures, if you would, please. Something doesn't work. <laughs> so, so at least at SparkFun, uh, we have a culture of sort of you know admitting failure, screwing up, and admitting to it, moving on. Right? And so at SparkFun, we're very transparent. We've been through all sorts of stuff. We've screwed up all sorts of things. We've met, made, met, made bad decisions. But as long as we're forthcoming with it, cool, let's go on. Um, now, if we mess up or, or screw up the same thing twice or three times, now we need to have a discussion. But that there is, it, there's, at least at SparkFun, um, creative chaos, and it, it's sort of encouraged to try it you know, I, yeah, I won't fault you for trying. I will fault you for messing up your job two or three times. Failurely fail often is the Modbot corporate mantra and it's pasted up on the wall and spray painted and everything. Uh, we run modular robotics like a series of experiments. We're not copying kind of a business model that's happened before. So we recognize that anything we try has a high likelihood of failure. So we think about the scale of experiments. Are we running a $100 experiment, $1,000 experiment, a $10,000 experiment. We can afford to run a $100,000 experiment every once in a while, but pretty much everything that we do is, 
we come at with the idea of trying to fail as quickly as possible to figure out what doesn't work. Maybe one more question? know any more than all of you out there. I think the reason why some of us are up here is because we had this sense of fearlessness. You know, some of us were able to jump in. I, I joined Sphero as the fourth hire and I've been there. But it was like I took less pay. And and you know, as you guys have started your respective businesses, you know, I think being able to, to teach kids that it's okay to fear uh, fail, but also Instilling this sense of fearlessness in them. Don't let them. Don't let them grow up and, and be scared of things. Like, because that's how you start businesses. That's how you. That's how you create change. That's how you start a revolution. You know. That's. Um, so as far as how that relates to passion, I mean, I'm super passionate about the people I work with and the products we're building, and this opportunity that I have to help. You know, it may sound like rainbow skies and, and cheesy, but just. Have, you know, it's humanity. Let's, let's, we're all in this together. Let's move the world forward. Um, that, that's what I'm passionate about. Uh, you asked sort of what inspired me uh, to start at SparkFun, uh, or at least start the company, is um, I was sort of building these electronic things, and I would show my friends. And uh, every once in a while, one of my friends would get inspired to do electronics. And I was like, oh my goodness, we can be friends. And I was, I'm this nerd. And so I didn't have a lot of friends. And so suddenly I can share my hobby with other friends. And um, that's what drives me is like, look at this thing. It's so cool. And look, we can, we can build amazing things. I don't care about building the next MP3 player. I don't care about making a, a denser hard drive. I care about these beautiful pieces of interactive art. And like thinking about how we can apply this over here, and like, oh, you have these skills, and I, oh, let's get together and do something awesome. So um, that is what inspired me to do Spark Fun because it meant um, we could do bigger things together. Uh, <coughs> everything can be inspirational. Uh, I'll give you a little Keyblitz origin story. I was inspired by a shitty job. Uh, I went to school for architecture and worked in architecture for a few years after graduating. I got a job at Wolf Lion, which is a great architecture firm in Boulder with this really nice office and spent 50 or 60 hours a week slouching in my chair with three monitors running AutoCAD, draw line, single, 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 drawing like interior bathroom elevations of some mixed use development that somebody else designed. It was awful, so I finally freaked out. What like, like my inspiration is that I'm simply unemployable. Uh, left, didn't want to do that. For, you know, it was just awful. I was getting carpal tunnel syndrome and everything at 23 years old, and, and that's no way to live your life. Uh, so I actually went back to graduate school very specifically to try and create some sort of tangible, physical something that creative people like designers and architects could use to interact with computation, because computation is super powerful in digital modeling without always having to sit behind the screen and the keyboard to solve basically my problem of, wow, I'm only 23 and I've just resigned myself to this whole career in front of me that I'm absolutely going to hate. Uh, that physical thing eventually uh, my partner at the time was working in the science center and she was teaching all these activities and she brought some in. We realized it was a great thing for kids and the resolution was a little too low to do the design and computation stuff that we wanted to do and it morphed and became a robot construction toy for kids. It sounds to me, I'm sorry, uh, that sharing your passion with others combined with solving a problem of yours, right? How to make more friends or how to solve your shitty job or how to you know, change the world with your passion is sort of an underlying theme. Assessment. Excellent. Us. Unless there's another super burning question, we'll move to our next. Go for it. Uh, I was wondering if you guys would be willing to speak a little bit about your relationships with the classrooms mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and perhaps where you might 
hope that would evolve to. So um, our relationship with the classrooms is uh, very wide. Um, we have, I don't want to talk a lot about products, but we have a lot of products to cover everything um, from squishy circuits, right? Um, kind of um, kindergarten sort of stuff all the way up to NASA, right? We can build small sets and we can launch stuff for a couple hundred bucks in the space. Um, so it, it's a lot of steps to get there. Um, but we have a lot of products and a lot of curriculum and um, a lot of educators, professional developers in the audience here today that are doing amazing stuff all over North America to try to show folks like, hey, it's not just about electrical engineering. It's about these phones, these black boxes that we just, instead of consuming technology, how can we open it up a little bit and understand the skills that you're going to need to be successful as the next generation of humans on this planet? Um, so uh, that's sort of our, we touch a lot of different places um, inside the different grades. Again, my passion is I had to blink an LED when I was a senior in college. If I can show a 10th grader how to blink an LED, how much more successful are they going to be? They're really going to be really successful. So that's us. Awesome. Sorry. No, that's good. that was a great answer. Um, so my personal relationship with classroom is almost nil because I'm scared of children. <laughs> I also look really bad in a denim dress. Um, oh, teacher dig, sorry about that. Uh, uh, but but uh, you might be entertained by kind of like our brief history of engaging with the classroom. So we started to make cubelets and we thought, oh, educational toy, this is really cool. We were engaging a lot with science centers, children's museums, that whole area, informal education, and getting these great results, education, everybody was into it. All right, great, we've got a mandate, let's make these things. We finally started to make them. We started out with Boing Boing readers and Alpha Geeks, and we got some pre-orders, and then thought, great, this is, we're gonna get right into the classroom. And then we realized that you, you can't just like put a product into the classroom if you don't speak education. You can't put something in the Edmund Scientific Catalog and think that it's going to help kids or make any sort of impact or even get bought if it's just a product that's there. And uh, we got hit upside the head with that, so we stopped and we pulled back and we fulfilled the Alpha Key Point Boing Reader orders and thought about how we could actually make a change and get into the classroom and be successful. Fast forward a year and a half later, we hired an education director, we hired a couple of curriculum writers, and we just started to generate material. Curricula, activities, standards aligned, lesson plans, all that stuff. Develop it, audit it, put it up on the web for free. And people, we started to meet people at ISTE and at FETSI and some of the technology conferences and people started to download the free curricula because apparently there's like a thing where teachers and schools and districts pay for curricula and activities and lesson plans and that seems like a crazy, crazy thing for me, right? Information wants to be free, all that stuff should just be available so we can all learn like MIT Open Courseware. But apparently teachers are used to paying for curricula and this sort of stuff. So we barfed it up online and gave it to everybody and, and people started to kind of adopt. And then we started to see an increase in orders from schools and we started to hear from teachers. Teachers love to tweet. And we started to hear more and more and get these larger orders, and then there would be an order for a school. And then last two Julys ago, we got this purchase order over email from a school district in Florida for $106,000 worth of cubelets out of the blue. You know, which, is, which is like a month and a half's production for us. We have no idea what to do with that. Um, that's a little story about our relationship with the classroom and where we are right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we very much like to have a pulse on what's going on in the classroom and what's going on with our educational products. Uh, we, we actually have Danny. I don't know if you can raise your hand. Uh, so Danny is a former teacher. She's on the community team. She actually, um, her job is to go out and talk directly with teachers, like find out what their pain points are, find out how we can build a better product for them. And so the way our company is structured is for each product, we have uh, essentially a product manager who is in charge of you know, delivering the product, building the product, all that stuff. We also have a community relations person who is in charge of really identifying the person who's going to use the product and how can we keep on iterating so that this product will be beneficial in your lives, whether it's an educational product or uh, a consumer product or a Star Wars product. We, we just want to make sure that we're delivering on the promises that we're setting out. So, I mean, she's very much like out in the classroom uh, and has her pulse on you know what what our community is doing. So it's a very we get, it's hard to scale, but it's we try to make it a very close relationship. 
Any last words, you guys? Anything else you would be heart sick if you left here without being able to say? <laughs> Any summary? Um, I guess I'll just say, uh, this is like a concept we've been playing with uh, at our company. And we might you know, use it for uh, one of the, the videos that we're producing, but uh, just understand that not all heroes wear capes. I think the stuff that you guys are doing in the classroom is, is impacting kids more than I think you know. And so I think we all want to do whatever makes you successful. So I don't know, just, just keep that in mind. If it gets hard, it's rough. Um, but I don't know, don't, don't give up. Uh, I just wanted to give a, a quick plug. Uh, I was just at the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. because Modular Robotics is funded through a couple of grants from the National Science Foundation, which is cool. Uh, government money to for-profit companies to further science education, I mean, that, that, that's really cool. So we've gotten four grants from the National Science Foundation. Uh, part of the requirements of getting grants is that you have to go to these awful, boring meetings in the basement of the Marriott in Washington, D.C. And at one, they unveiled their new Maker Ed initiative. So I don't know if any of you guys are into this. National Science Foundation has a series of grants called the EIR grant. We've gotten four of them, Small Business Innovation Research. They've all been a little dry. They've all been a little traditional. It's been hard to get like kind of futuristic, making hands-on projects through. But now they have this brand new initiative. They just announced it on their website. If anybody's applying for grants or thinking about something having to do with the maker movement and kids, the National Science Foundation now has a whole set of grants that are explicitly for that. So, sorry. Maybe when, um, afterwards we'll share some information about those kind of things. So I'll, I'll plug up your email inbox again. The request. <laughs> so excellent. Thank you all so much.